Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about the five properties of forces and more specifically, how these five properties are conveyed using vectors. So a force is a vector quantity. Now a vector is different from a scalar because a vector has both a magnitude and a direction and some other things that you'll see in a minute here. We can't just depict force using a scalar number because all that would convey is the magnitude. So if I told you that somebody was able to express 5,000 newtons of force, well, you might ask, well, in which direction? Is it downwards? Is it forwards? Is it upwards? What's the point of application? And so we depict a vector using an arrow. All right, in the system below, as, remember, a system is any object that is of analytical interest to the biomechanist. In this case, the system consists of a box and a table. And the only reason it's of interest is because it's helping us learn about force vectors. So in this system, which is comprised of a box and a table, I might ask, what are the forces acting on the system? You, hopefully, you would correctly say gravity. That's one force acting on the system. So let's go ahead and draw gravity coming down, straight down from the center of mass of the object, and we'll represent it with F sub G, or the force of gravity. The other force acting on it is the normal force. The normal force is that force between two objects that are acted upon by gravity that are holding them together. So normal force is pushing back up against gravity, like so, and it's going to be about equal to it, or exactly equal to it in this case, because the box isn't moving. It's not crashing through the table, where gravity would be overcoming the normal force, um, and it's not floating up into the air either. It's just staying right there on the table. So we will call that F sub N. Okay, so those are two forces that are canceling each other out in the system that we're looking at. Now notice that they both have a direction. One's pointing up and one's pointing down. So direction, check. They have an orientation. So orientation here refers to their orientation in regards to to the Cartesian coordinate system. So in this case, if we have a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate plane with a y and an x component, where y is vertical and x is horizontal, then in this case, the normal force is positive, positive, um, and the gravitational force is negative in the y-axis. They have a point of application, which is the center of mass of the box. They have a magnitude, which we haven't given the magnitude in newtons, but we do know that they are equal to each other. And they have a line of action, which is an imaginary line running infinitely through the tip and the tail of each vector. So in this case, the line of action is running in, these, in this direction. Okay, so that describes the forces that are currently acting on the box, but what if we wanted to apply a force to the box? So let's go ahead and do that. Let's apply this force, and we'll call that force applied to the box. When we do that, when we apply that force, it will produce motion if it overcomes all of the resistant forces um, to the motion of the box. Remember the law of inertia, so an object at rest will, will tend to stay at rest um, unless there's a force that acts upon it and that overcomes those other forces keeping it there. So in this case, let's say that the forces that we have to overcome are air resistance, which will be a small force, as well as the force of gravity, as well as the force of friction. Now we know there are two types of friction and that's for another lesson, but there's static friction and kinetic friction. And in this case, you have to overcome the static friction first, which has a, a greater coefficient than kinetic friction um, once the box gets sliding. But for simplicity's sake, we'll just call it uh, the force of friction. Now, if your applied force is greater than both of these two resistive forces, then we will have motion of the box. And what, what I should do is actually make this force applied a little bit long, longer to show a greater magnitude of force because if we added together these two forces that I drew, the way that I drew them, it looks like they are actually a bit greater than the force applied. So there we go, that's better. So if, if we applied this force, then the box would move in the positive x direction. 
Okay, but that's not a very interesting system of interest for a biomechanist. What if we were talking about something much more interesting, like getting a sick pump in your bicep? Okay, this is infinitely more interesting than a box on a table. So what I've done is drawn an arm, which will now be the system of interest, curling 40 pounds. And right now it's right at the sticking point. So how are we going to determine the forces acting on this system? Let's start by drawing a free body diagram. So first we are going to mark the joints, the elbow joint and the shoulder joint. And then I've already drawn the central point uh, for the center of mass for the dumbbell is right there at the center of the dumbbell. Okay, now I will connect these points using lines for the segments of the humerus and of the radius and ulna. Okay, now we have the joints marked, the shoulder and the elbow, um, as well as the center of mass of the weight. Okay, and remember it's a weight that has mass and it only has weight because gravity is acting upon it. So let's determine the forces. Now if we're trying to move this weight using a concentric contraction of the biceps brachii, it will move in an arc this way. Okay, so the forces resisting that motion will be several. We will have air resistance, which will be minimal. And we will have gravity. Now, what are the forces that are acting on that weight to curl it up? Well, that's going to be the force from your biceps brachii and other muscles. Um, but let's say it's acting right about there and it is pulling straight up. Okay. So I know I didn't draw this perfectly at 90-90, but let's, let's assume that this um, upward force is perpendicular to the forearm. Now what we've created is a lever, and we're not going to talk too much about levers today, that's going to be for another lesson, but just know that this lever consists of a fulcrum with a resistive force. Here's that fulcrum, and here is the muscular force. Now because of this lever, it's a third class lever. So in this case, the biceps brachii is experiencing a mechanical disadvantage. In third class levers, the moment arm of the muscle or of the applied force is smaller than that of the resistive force or the weight that they're trying to overcome. Notice that the distance from the fulcrum to the muscle is much smaller than, than the distance between the fulcrum to the resistive force. So the biceps brachii is acting at a large mechanical disadvantage. So if we are going to overcome the force of gravity, in reality we actually have to have a much bigger force than what I've drawn. So if I was to draw this force more to scale, it would be something Maybe like that. Okay, so the force of your biceps brachii has a direction. It is pulling straight up. It has an orientation, so it's going in the positive y direction. And that orientation now, it depends on our frame of reference, right? If we're thinking of this from a um, somatic frame of reference, or maybe it's a global frame of reference, it, it's going to differ. But from a somatic frame of re reference where our system is this arm, it's gonna be in a positive y direction. The point of application is um, right here on the forearm, on the uh, proximal part of the forearm, right where the biceps brachii is inserting. And it has a magnitude, which in this case is uh, needing to be many times greater than that of the force of gravity on the weight because of the mechanical disadvantage of the biceps brachii due to the third class lever setup. And finally, we can draw the line of action, which is an imaginary line that extends if infinitely through the tip and the tail of this vector. Okay, so there you have it, two examples of how we use 
force vectors in biomechanics. One from more of a basic physics standpoint and the other from more of a biomechanical standpoint using the actual human body. In the next video, we'll be talking about Newton's laws of motion and how they apply specifically to biomechanics with some great examples. So click on over here if you want to follow that and continue down this biomechanics journey. As always, if this content was helpful, please give it a like, a thumbs up, subscribe to the content. This has been Dr. Gooden with Forces and Their Properties. See you guys next time.